Is Luke still playing? Okay, so when he's done, then he's going to play some basketball. Okay. I thought that was the plan. We hope it doesn't have to Yeah, sure. <laughs> Good morning, Otter Creek. It is so good to see you this morning. I hope you've already had a great morning. Hope you've had a chance to get some coffee, uh, maybe attend a class this morning and have a good conversation about our God. But we're so thankful that you have gathered with us this morning to worship uh, Creator God. Thank you for being here. Uh, if you're a guest with us, we want you to know that we're especially honored that you're here. We know that uh, it's, a, it's a sacrifice to take some time out of your Sunday uh, daytime, and so we're so thankful that you would carve that time out to, to gather and worship with us and share uh, in this experience of, of table and singing and hearing, hearing scripture this morning. Uh, we want to get to know you, and we also want you to have a really good experience at Otter Creek, and so there's a welcome center out in the foyer just as you exit just to your left, uh, and there's some people out there that want to meet you, want to tell you a little bit more about Otter Creek, so if you would stop by there on your way out. We'd love uh, to have that chance to interact with you there. Uh, let me encourage you to take one of the attendance registries on the pew next to you. If you would fill that out and pass that to your neighbor so they can fill that out, uh, we, would, we would appreciate that. And then also just a little bit of housekeeping. Let me give you a heads up. Uh, Thanksgiving is coming. I know you've already bought your turkey and your pumpkin pie. You're ready to go. Before you share that meal with your family on Thursday, Thanksgiving, this is a couple weeks out, I would like for you to go ahead and plan to, to come here at 9 o'clock in the morning, Thanksgiving morning. We'll have a time of worship and reflection and just offer some gratitude to God. So uh, I would invite you to do that. And I would encourage you to maybe invite a neighbor who maybe doesn't have a church family or even folks you know who might not be believers. We would love to invite them to that service so they can uh, participate in, in expressing gratitude. So uh, mark your calendars. Thanksgiving morning at 9 o'clock is that service. Also, today is Orphan Sunday, so I want you to know that as we sit in this room, there are millions of Christians, millions of believers all around the world who are joining us today to turn our hearts towards orphans and to recognize their plight, their situation in the world, and uh, try and trying to uh, increase the compassion in our hearts uh, to care for those uh, who need our love and concern. So Otter Creek is involved in these ministries you see on the, on the screen, Exile International, Made in the Streets, Hisdom, and Agape. That was started here at Otter Creek in the 60s. Uh, Otter Creek has this long tradition of caring for orphans, and we want that to continue. You're going to get to hear from Ruslan, who works with Hisdom, uh, in just a few minutes. But, but be prayerful this morning. Be aware that uh, there are some children in the world who need our care. And then finally, uh, this morning I get to introduce to you several new folks who are joining our family as we uh, try to form ourselves into this family and, and become more like Jesus. We've got some folks that want to join that journey, so we want to welcome them. Uh, for, you'll see their pictures on the screen. First, uh, Becky and Peter Clark are right back here. What, can I get you guys to stand and let's welcome the Clarks to the Otter Creek family? Glad to see you this morning, and also the Johnson family, Jason, Carrie, Katie, and Brooks. They are over here to my left. Welcome. So glad to see you. And then also the Mangrums, Daniel, Jennifer, and their four kids, Samuel, Micah, Elijah, and Sophia. They are back here. Would you guys stand? Welcome the Mangrums. Glad you guys are here. I've, got, I've had a lot of fun getting to know them over the last year or so. And then also, not here this morning, but we want to recognize Lance Wheeler, who's married to um, Sarah Sherman Wheeler, who we know and love. So you can see his picture on the screen. He's joining us as well. Look for those folks and welcome them. If you're sitting nearby one of those, those people we just met, make sure you introduce yourself and welcome them to Otter Creek. And then also at uh, first service, we met several others. We've, had, uh, we've got 11 families joining us today. It's about 30 people. That's exciting. Uh, we met the Bassham's, Allison and Clayton, Larry and Melissa Griffith, Holly and Brian Lewis, Bill and Sarah Beth Litzenberg, Alan and Beth Powell, 
Chuck and Karen Reese and Caroline and Matt and their, their little girl Harper Bell royalty. So look for all those folks. I'm referring to this paper, which you stand together, and let's prepare our hearts for worship this morning.
shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus
I'm in uniform today because tomorrow is Veterans Day and I'm in the military. My daughter is up here because she probably should have been in the military, but her mother wouldn't let me bring her to the Marine Corps recruiter. <laughs> Just kidding about that. Sort of. No, she's up here because she's a patriot. I don't know a better one. She loves her country. She loves soldiers. She loves the military, and she married a firefighter. I don't have Facebook, uh, but my wife shows me what she posts from time to time, and I do know this. Kristen is well aware that it's Veterans Day tomorrow, and she started celebrating it a week ago. My wife is sitting right there. She's not going to wave or anything. She's, somebody pointed her out. Good. Right there. My wife is right there. She's a patriot. If you Google the words military spouse, you will have Trish Kirby. Those words appear. So when you go home, try that. But she this morning was sitting next to my sister who was in the early service. My sister's a patriot. She was a constant companion on email when I was in Afghanistan. Um, and of course, they were sitting next to the firefighter this morning. And I'm a patriot. I've been in this uniform for 36 years and counting. I've been deployed three times. I'm committed to uphold and to defend the Constitution of the United States of America. I had promised to serve and protect my fellow soldiers and the interests of this nation and risk my life for it. But we are all a patriotic family here, my family and yours. Maybe you're all feeling a little more patriotic since we've been up here. We're all here to celebrate a Pledge of Allegiance of a different kind. You realize that it was on Passover that Jesus did this. He initiated this on Passover. Do you realize that Passover is the 4th of July, the Independence Day for the nation of Israel? And he turned the whole thing upside down and said these words. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. We are indeed a very patriotic family. We are a military family. We love our country, and yes, I am married to a first responder. But we are reminded that the cause of Christ and his interests come first. We remember his body and blood and pledge our commitment to him. 
What we are about to do is the Christian Pledge of Allegiance. We are all soldiers of Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this country. Thank you for our part in it. Thank you for the men and women who serve this country every single day. May you protect them and keep them safe. But as we pledge allegiance to you this morning, as we take these emblems, Father, help us to remember that you we serve ultimately, we're responsible to you, and we know what you sacrificed to bring us into your kingdom. In Christ's name.
Sunday. There are churches all over the country, organizations all over the country, giving a special emphasis to the fact uh, that many people in this world grow up without a mother or, or a father. Um, in Otter Creek, we have a rich heritage of supporting orphan care ministries, foster care, and, adop and adoption, <clears throat> and those organizations. And uh, HISDOM is one such organization that we have partnered with as a church, and many of you in here as individuals have partnered with financially, and we thank you so much for that. It is an organization dedicated to showing orphans the way to Christ. Uh, Ruslan is here from, from Belarus, from Russia, uh, with us for a few weeks, and, and he's going to tell you a little bit about one way you could partner with us. Uh, Otter Creek is a church that loves camp, and Best Friends Camp happens uh, every summer and, and will happen again this summer in 2020. And so I'm going to let Ruslan tell you a little bit about how that is an opportunity to show orphans the way to Christ. Uh, good morning. Uh, you can see the picture, and you can see the... Uh, I want to introduce uh, someone special. Uh, Valera, he's 18. Uh, he's in a white T-shirt next to his uh, foster mom. So he, Valera was an orphan most of his uh, childhood. Uh, at 10 years old, he actually met with his Christian uh, foster parents, Ala and Dima. They are both on the pictures on the picture. So uh, we really love Ala and Dima and Valera and uh, all of their family, I mean our ministry. We support them through the different programs to empower uh, them just to uh, foster and uh, disciple their uh, biological kids and their foster children. Part of, uh, part of this uh, discipling process, we uh, kind of see our best friend camp, uh, which is designed for foster parents and adoptive parents where they can stay uh, for about a week together with their children, do some sports, spiritual classes, and everything. This is a very special time. And Valera, who is 18, I remind you, he came there with his whole family uh, and uh, spent a week there. And after that, shortly after that, uh, he decided, the, uh, he made the most important decision in his life. He was baptized, and he became a part of the Pure Heart Church of Brest. So uh, that is uh, what happened recently this, uh, this year. And I, when I talked to Dima, Valera's father, he said he's really appreciated that his dom ministry empowered their family to bring Valera to Christ. And it is not the end of the story. Dim, uh, Dima and his wife, Ala, they're so dedicated to serve orphans. Besides of uh, Valera, they also have Sergey. He's also in that picture. And uh, as their orphan son, and also uh, they have four of their biological kids, and they exp they expect the fifth. Uh, also, they said they won't have five children on their own, and they want to uh, foster care plus three or four. So this is how or, uh, our minister supports this family and so, uh, show orphans the way to Christ in Belarus and in Russia. I feel lucky enough I've been able to meet Dima and his wife and, and hang out with them and they are a special family and, and one of many families that, that is um, changing culture and changing the church in Russia and Belarus and we're thankful to partner with them in that. We are going to let Ruslan pray a prayer over our offering at Otter Creek that goes uh, to support lots of ministries here at this church uh, and specifically we're in prayer over those that support foster children and adoptive uh, families and so we're going to let Russia, Ruslan read a, lead us in a prayer in Russian today. Uh, so uh, let's pray together. Uh, and before I will say this prayer in Russian, I would, say, I would like to say, please uh, spend your attention and, uh, you know, for Agape, adopt and foster care locally. What, this is what we do back in Belarus and in Russia. This is really important. Dear Heavenly Father, дорогой Небесный Отец, спасибо тебе за сегодняшний день, за эту службу, за церковь Отер Крик, за тех людей, которые приводят сирот к Тебе, Господь, служат Тебе, Господь, здесь и по всему миру. Молим и просим Тебя, именем Сына Твоего Иисуса Христа, благословляй нас. Аминь. To you. Look around and see those who are.
One of my favorite things about honoring men and women who have served in the military is they're always the last ones who want you to do it. Um, and, I, and I love that about you. And I can see it on your face uh, when you stand to do that. So today we're going to have an adult, uh, big boy, big girl conversation about the idol of nation. And we're going to talk about what it means to be a citizen in this country, what it means to love Jesus and the kingdom of God, and what it means to live in this particular moment in time um, in our culture. And so we've been kind of building towards this over the last few weeks by talking about idols of the heart. We've been talking about how idols affect us personally or individually, which most conservative Protestants or evangelicals are comfortable with. But now I'm going to stretch some of you today because the Bible doesn't just talk about sin in terms of our individual lives. Sometimes the Bible talks about sin in terms of our collective life together. Um, read all of the prophets this week if you're wondering how that works. But what I want to do at the beginning of this teaching is I want to clearly differentiate between what it means to be a patriot of the United States and being a nationalist. And one of the reasons that we invited Jeff to come and um, to lead communion is I've had many conversations with Jeff over the years, and I know that in his heart, the kingdom of God is the most important thing to, to him. And so you can see him in his dress blues and, and in his regalia, but at the heart of him and stories and decisions he's had to make in Afghanistan, the kingdom of God is the most important thing to him. And so what does it mean for the rest of us who are trying to figure this out, especially in this divisive climate that we live in, both on the left and the right, equally contentious, equally fundamentalist, equally closed-minded? What does it mean for the church to rise above um, the shift from President Obama to President Trump, which was maybe the most dramatic shift we've had, certainly in my lifetime, maybe in American history. We could debate that. So I'm asking you to think critically and to think deeply with, this, with me this morning as we talk about Jesus. So it may help you to think about the difference between being a patriot and being a nationalist. A nationalist is someone who idolizes the country that they were born in to such a degree that the version of the country that they describe to themselves and to others is non-existent. They're describing a country that never existed. And so they live with this kind of mirage or this facade view of the country that they live in. And it happens in the United States. It happens in Kenya. It happens in Germany. It happens in every nation state, as we know that phrase and how that's evolved over the last 200 years. But it is this kind of naive retelling of the role of that particular nation on the global stage of world history and how God works through that. And you can usually spot a nationalist pretty quick because you can't say anything bad about the United States. Oh, you can say something bad about a particular party or a particular person or a particular kind of person, but you're not allowed to question or challenge the truth of the narrative that th those people are retelling about how we got to where we are in American culture today. A patriot, on the other hand, loves what is worth loving about the United States or Kenya or Canada or Mexico, or whatever country we're talking about. A patriot can say, this is what is good about our nation. But a patriot also loves his or her nation to such a degree that they are willing to also name the demons and the skeletons that exist because every single country has them. And a patriot recognizes that sometimes one of the most patriotic things to do is to question the system is to challenge the status quo, is to ask for justice for all people, is to ask tough questions. And one of the things I've observed, both when President Obama served in his eight years and now President Trump entering into his fourth year, is that some of us, you scratch right below the surface, and the line gets really blurry between being a patriot and being a nationalist. And so this is our ethical tension. As the church, who's part of a global movement of Christians that transcends race and politics and what your passport says, like we have this higher allegiance, this higher law of love, this higher standard of the life of Jesus, we have to create an ethic about how we think about these things that is consistent with how we want our Kenyan brothers and sisters to think. 
how our German brothers and sisters think. Are you with me? So we can't live in kind of this ghetto of American privilege and just expect everyone to look up to the United States if we are not willing to internally look at our own selves and our own country and to be patriots who tell the truth about what we love, diversity, the free market, inclusion, opportunity, uh, the incredible diversity of the United States. Every time I travel outside of the United States and I come back, I think I, our diversity is mind-blowing. But I also love the United States enough to say, and here's how we got here. And here's the messy truth of our history. And here's the complicated reality of our current situation. So I want to give you three texts, three snapshots that I think frame this conversation. And in 22 minutes, there's no way you can resolve something as complicated as the idol of nation. But it does give us a framework to work and live from. The first snapshot, if you have your New Testament, is in Luke chapter 20. Now, they're trying to test Jesus, which if you've been reading the Gospel of Luke, never works well. They set a trap for him. And they set a trap in Luke chapter 20 because they want Jesus to speak in to the most divisive political debate of the first century, paying taxes to Caesar. See, for Jews in the first century, you could not separate your religion from your politics. I'm thankful for the separation of church and state. I think it was a brilliant idea, and I I think it's going to serve the, the United States well in the future. But don't read back into the first century and read it as we would as Americans. This is a different world you're reading back into. So for Jews in the first century who cannot separate their faith, their religion from their politics... The idea of having to pay taxes to Caesar, who does not respect God as Yahweh, as the one creator of the world, is a violation of every religious principle that has formed Israel to be who they are in that present moment. It goes against everything they've been taught about Torah, everything they know about being created in the image of God. To to acknowledge to have to pay to Caesar is, is, uh, it's offensive, it's deeply offensive to them. And so all the messiahs who come before Jesus, because he's not the first to claim it, and all the would-be messiahs who come after him, like Simon bar Kokhba, this is the key political hot-button issue of the first century. And so they're looking for a way to test him, because the Jews can't crucify him. They don't have that authority. So they're trying to trap him. They're trying to show the Roman government, hey, you shouldn't trust this guy. And so they set the trap. And here's how Luke records the story. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be honest in order to trap him by what he said, so as to hand him over to the jurisdiction and authority of the governor. They asked him, teacher, we know that you are right in what you say and teach, and you show deference to no one but teach the way of God in accordance with truth. Now you know a slam's coming, right? Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus perceived their craftiness, and he said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose head and whose title does it bear? They said, The emperor's. He said to them, Then give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. Now, here's how I heard this text taught when I, as a child, and I'm not saying exactly where I picked this up. I'm just saying this is what I thought it meant all growing up. There is a realm in your life that is divided for nation, and there is a realm in your life divided for God, and you are to be good citizens in both realms because both matter. And I think that's a decent interpretation. The problem is the interpretation lacks historical awareness of why Jesus asked for a denarius. So let me show you an image of a coin uh, from the first century that we have. It was common about the time of the birth of Jesus for Roman citizens to describe the Caesar or or, uh, what we would call the president of the Roman Empire, the Caesar, as the agent of God ruling over planet Earth. Uh, The Caesar often received titles like son of God or son of the gods. 
You've heard the phrase Pax Romana, which describes the era in which Jesus is born, a time of Roman peace. Many Caesars in Roman history are referred to as the Prince of Peace. So the Caesar was given great authority within the Roman Empire. As they are expanding their borders and take in all these minority subjects, these small groups of people, they come upon this super stubborn group in the western part of their empire known as the Jews. And they are more stubborn and cantankerous than any group they've ever dealt with. Just read a little bit of Roman history and you'll know how the Romans felt about the Jews. And these Jews are so stubborn, they will not give their allegiance to Caesar. And on the coin that's depicted here is a divine relegation to Caesar's status. It reads, Caesar, son of the God, son of gods. So you have to listen carefully to what Jesus is doing. He is surgically undoing the very assumption that drives their question. When he says, give to, G- give to God what is God and give to the emperor what is the emperor's, what he's saying is, I know the emperor says that those are one and the same. That's not true. Don't ever confuse Yahweh God who created the whole world, who sent his son in the form of the kingdom of God to come to you. Don't ever mix up the fact that these are not the same. They're not playing on the same team. They're not working for the same goal. So go ahead and pay. But I know what the back of the coin says. And your very question has problems with it. Now this is interesting because it's going to frame the way that Paul thinks about what it means to be a citizen. Paul is the first one that I'm aware of in church history who really has to think through the idol of nation, which I'm calling our attention to this morning. So we know from birth that Paul is a Roman citizen. And yet, when Paul encounters the risen Christ and has his life turned upside down, he very rarely ever uses the privilege of being a Roman citizen. Consider these two snapshots. The first one comes, he's in trouble because there is a woman who's being exploited for economic purposes. She has a demon in her and a particular gift, and this guy that owns her is exploiting her. And so it's this fascinating story where you have like the Pentecostals and the social justice people. It all meets in one particular story. And Paul is adamant that the resurrection of Jesus has created a new order, a new way of being human. And so he is going to speak life into this woman by removing the demon in Jesus' name because she's being exploited for economic reasons. And people don't like that. People don't like when you upset the social norms. So Paul is true to the lineage of Jesus is where wherever the kingdom of God comes into contrast with cultural practices or socially accepted beliefs, the, the people who represent the kingdom of God are going to speak into it. And so Paul does that, and it gets him in trouble. And so now he's responding to this in Acts 16. But Paul replied, they have beaten us in public, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison, and now they're going to just discharge us in secret? Certainly not. Let them come and take us out themselves. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. Paul waits to the end to reveal his citizenship. Or what about this snapshot? This is Paul and Silas in the Philippi prison. I love this story. You you probably know it. Uh, They're, they're, again, creating social unrest. They're they're making good Roman citizens nervous, not just because they're preaching Jesus crucified and raised from the dead, but they're saying that Jesus' resurrection has real-world implications, things that you got to change, social norms that got to be challenged. And all the Romans are saying, can't you just go be good Christians and not bother us? And they're like, no, we're in public, we're in the streets, we're in the marketplace, we're bringing this message of the kingdom of God to every nook and cranny of culture. And they say, okay, then you can have some time in prison. Only they convert the jailer, and then he, in this section, invites them over for dinner. That guy had no chance to keep his job, right? You did what? You got to meet him. 
And then Luke records this part of the story. But when they had tied him up with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who is uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went to the tribune and said to him, what are you about to do? This man is a Roman citizen. The tribune came and asked Paul, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, yes. The tribune answered, it cost me a large sum of money to get my citizenship. I love how Paul just drops the mic. But I was born a citizen. Immediately, those who were about to examine him drew back from him. And the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. Now, the reason this is significant is this is the first time in the early, like the church is like a toddler in this part of Acts. Like the t- church is just learning to walk and talk and, and eat its food. But you see from the very beginning of the church, this tension, how do I stay faithful to the kingdom of God and the message of Jesus? But I am located in a very particular culture with very specific beliefs and values. And every Christian who's ever lived in the history of the world has to wrestle with these things. And Paul is front stage, center, wrestling with his identity. And I think when you read through the book of Acts, Paul inspired by the life of Jesus, I think a principle emerges that is extremely helpful for us today. I would summarize it like this. Paul valued his citizenship in as much as it allowed him to do what God had called him to do. Can you imagine Paul telling Peter, Man, you're missing out. You're not a citizen. Can you imagine him? Can you imagine Paul telling Peter, you can't challenge the Roman Empire. Like, look at all the good it's done in the world. Look how powerful it is. No, because Paul held his citizenship differently. He valued, Paul valued his relationship with Jesus more than his citizenship. When he believed he could leverage his citizenship to fulfill his calling, He would do so, but only for that specific reason. Why does he wait to the end to tell people he's a citizen? The answer is simple, and it's been there the whole time when we've been reading Acts and we don't see it, because he didn't value it as much as we do, our citizenship. He didn't think about himself as a Roman first. He thought about himself as a Jesus person first, middle, and last. And when he finds himself in a situation where he realizes, if I'm killed, if I'm not released from prison, then I can't keep doing what God called me to do. And so when he can use his citizenship as a trump card, he will do it. But it's not his identity, and it's not the most important thing to him. See, a Christian nationalist makes that the most important thing. But a Christian patriot recognizes that the hope of the world is not God somehow making a Christian nation. That's idolatry. The hope of the world is that the way of Jesus would infect people in every nation so that planet earth would begin to look like the coming future of the kingdom of God, not some idealized country that never existed. Are you with me? It's a very different model of how the church viewed their role in the world. So let me be clear. For me personally and how I think about idolatry as it relates to living, again, whether you live in Kenya or Germany, we live in the United States, I think it is good and right to talk about what we do well in the United States and why so many people from all over the world want to live here and want to flourish. And it's not just about economics. It's also about opportunity. It's also about diversity. It's also about inclusion. It's also the idea of Staten Island, that anyone can come here and create a new world, a new story for themselves. We should rightly name and celebrate those things. But because we're patriots, we're not willing to ignore everything it cost us as a country to get to the place where we are. Are you with me? Okay, I'm by myself. (laughs) The crucifixion will happen at 1215. This is what I'm saying. 
I'm going to talk to my boys about the genocide of Native Americans. I'm not afraid to talk to them about it because it's true. And what we, as as descendants of Europeans, did to a whole group of people is an abomination and an offense to the living God who made every person in God's image. And what our ancestors did to African slaves, which we are still feeling the repercussions of in urban areas today, is part of our American story. And to deny it is like the family that has all kinds of secrets and abuse, and all the kids are like, oh, we're fine, everything's fine. And everyone around them knows you're not fine. Every nation has demons. Let me ask you this. I coached a kid, a young kid when I was in a graduate student at Abilene Christian. His name was Matthias Craig. He was from Stuttgart, Germany. He went all the way through public school in Germany, and he did not ever have one class on the Holocaust. Is it a good planet to live on when German kids aren't taught about the Holocaust? You know the answer to that. The answer is no. Is it good if kids in Rwanda grow up not knowing about what happened in April of 1994 and how over a million people were killed in 90 days? Is, is, it, is that a good place to live? No. So if we expect other nations, this is our ethical dilemma, if we expect other nations to tell the truth about their messy history, we'd better go first. And we shouldn't be afraid of it. And it shouldn't make you un-American to do it. If anything, it should make you more American. The same Latino, the same black people, the same Kurdish people, the same white people bleed for our country just like Jeff does. And the church should tell the truth about what is great about the United States and we should be able to talk about our sins. That's the Christian category of confession. This is what is difficult for us as Americans because we're comfortable talking about pornography or we're comfortable talking about greed or we're we're at least willing, right? But when it comes to the bigger stuff, we're like, oh, you can't talk about that stuff. Read the Bible. The Bible will talk about anything, anytime, anywhere, and God's not afraid to challenge people on it. So, If you're wondering, how how do you even have these conversations in surgical ways, like careful ways? Let, Let me just ask two questions. Are you comfortable with people praising and telling the truth about our history? I'm going to say this as carefully but directly as I can. There's a whole body of research out there right now about why the American church is dying. And when you think, well, uh, Otter Creek's not dying. We're a big church. How many of your kids and your grandkids are not part of a church right now? Some of you are living this painfully. It hurts, right? Some of your kids and your grandkids, I'm not saying they left the church of Christ. I'm saying they've left the church, period. All the research that we have indicates that one of the top three reasons that so many people under the age of 30 have left the church is because they're tired of Christian nationalism. And they want to see their parents and their grandparents obsessed with Jesus not getting their particular political person in office. And one thing that would be beautiful for Otter Creek over the next 10 years is not only if we rise above partisan politics, but we recognize we're uniquely situated in our fellowship and in the city of Nashville to have more adult conversations. And when the world is saying, you got to put on this jersey that says Republican, or you got to put on this jersey that says Democrat, or you got to put on the invisible jersey that says Libertarian, that we say, we're not playing by those rules. Because here's what the New Testament says. There's only one jersey that lasts. Those who have been clothed in the blood, the justice, and the peace, and the righteousness of Jesus. And all the other jerseys are counterfeit. All the other jerseys are temporary. And if you get your identity from that, enjoy it while it lasts, because it's not lasting forever. And this shouldn't even be controversial. That's the saddest thing in all of this. The fact that it's controversial speaks to how far we've gone from the early church's insistence that Jesus Christ is Lord and everyone else is a huckster. But man, do we love Messiahs. 
When Obama came along, some of you wanted to just deify him. And some of you have way more confidence and hope in Trump than you should have. Nations rise and fall. Leaders come and go. But the name of the Lord is forever. So do you see the world? Second question, do you see the world in the right order? Are you a human made in the image of God first? Are you a Jesus person who believes the best way to be human is through the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus? And then do you think about what it means to live in your particular place? Well, because America would be better off if more of us were committed to the kingdom of God. Or do we reverse the order and practice Christian nationalism? I want to end with this story. This had a profound impact on me when I was in my mid-20s. I was a graduate student at Abilene Christian University in 2003 and 2004. And um, a, a friend of ours that you know who has preached here many times, Randy Harris, uh, became a mentor of mine while I lived in Abilene. And I will never forget, um, and Sam, this is a Texas story, man, so this is for you, okay? It's, it doesn't end well for Texans, but it's a Texan story, okay? So I'm in ACU Chapel in Moody Coliseum. There's 5,000 people, faculty, staff, and students. It's incredible. Students, at that time, ACU was an amazingly diverse school. There were students from all over the world. And on the opening convocation, the opening chapel day, every nation represented in the student body was represented by a flag on stage. And many students from Tanzania, from Guatemala, from all over the world, got to bring their country's flag onto stage, which is one thing I love. This is, the Pentecostals get this right. If you're going to bring a flag, bring all the flags. All the flags represented. And so you get to the end of this, and it's like the Olympics. They're going in order. And you're like, oh, that's a country? I didn't know that was a country. And they keep bringing all these flags on stage. The, the Colosseum is packed. And then, as God is my witness, the funniest thing happens. I don't know if this still happens. We've got some wild cattle on You guys can testify. But the, <laughs> you may not want to say that in 30 seconds. Okay, but here's what happens. The American flag comes on stage, and everyone goes crazy. Because you see the diversity represented, right? And then, after the American flag, they bring the Texas flag. Now, I grew up in Michigan. That's heresy. There's no flag that comes after the American flag. And the Texans did not find this ironic at all. Not even a little bit. So I'm at lunch with my friend Randy Harris. And I said, Randy, like, we got to shake this up. Like, what's up with that? And he said, here's why I like to use the image of what happens in the chapel. He said, there's a day coming. He said, this is the task of the preacher and prophetic imagination. There's a day coming when all the flags are represented, right? This is what Revelation is about. All the nations, all the kings, all the queens, all the presidents, all the prime ministers, all the nations of the world will be subject in judgment and mercy before King Jesus. And all those flags, including the United States and including Texas, will bow in the presence of King Jesus. And when that day happens, your flags do not matter. The jersey that you wear that says Republican or Democrat does not matter. The only thing that matters is that God has sent his son Jesus into the world to live and die and be raised again and to bring as many people into that story as possible and everything else is detail and distraction. And so there is a group of people on planet Earth. They meet in churches. They meet in coffee shops. They meet under trees. They meet in homes. They meet in prisons today. And we are committed. We're not singing the songs about Caesar. We'll let other people do that. We are committed to singing the songs of Jesus until he returns. And so our shepherds will be available both in the front and in the prayer room. If anything we've said the last several weeks about idols has touched you or you just want more discernment, you want to pray with some of these men who love to pray, um, they will be available. Let's stand and we'll pray together um, this prayer.
Let's pray this together. Father, Son, Spirit, we confess the Lordship of Jesus. Jesus alone is King. All other kings, rulers, and presidents are temporary. Forgive us when we put love of country over and above the work of Jesus. Help us to see our idols and the power they wield in our lives. May you come quickly, Lord Jesus. May you judge the kingdoms of the world with justice and mercy. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, thank you for this space. Thank you for a church that is willing to think about hard things. God, our hearts are open to you. God, anything that I've said that is not from you, may it be forgotten by tomorrow morning. But God, anything that I've said that is true of Jesus and Paul and the kingdom of God, may it stick. May it plant seeds deep in our hearts. God, thank you for Jesus. May we never grow tired of learning about him. His beauty, his wisdom, his justice, his teaching, his life, his sacrifice. And God, thank you for the men and women we honor today who serve this country. But when we have to choose, God, may we always choose the kingdom above all of our other allegiances. As together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow on heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Let's join with those voices after what we've just heard.